Good morning. Uh, I'm Lorenza Baroncelli. I'm the artistic director of La Triennale di Milano. And I'm here just to welcome all of you to this uh, intense day uh, on behalf of the president, Stefano Boeri. Um, you're going to have a very intense day so and of discussion. Uh, this is, I would say, uh, one of the most uh, important part of the 22nd International Exhibition. Uh, as you know, the 22nd International Exhibition uh, is a new beginning for La Triennale di Milano because for a long time the Triennale, the International Exhibition were closed. Um, with the, we start again with Paola Antonelli Exhibition and it was a great success. And uh, this is uh, the, the day of today is also a great demonstration of what we, what the, what the work has been, the, of the work that has been done. Uh, for us, this is just the beginning of a longer path uh, that will bring us to the next international exhibition that will be Austin Triennale in 2022. Um, and uh, we hope that the collaboration, so in, uh, interesting collaboration, and as the German, as the one we had with the German Pavilion, will be like bringing us, uh, wal uh, walking with us uh, in the next years. I would invite Marco San Micheli on the stage uh, with me because I think he will give the beginning of the discussion. Thank you, Lorenza, and good morning, everyone. As International Relations Chief Officer, it always sounds a bit funny, this uh, job title. I'm very happy to welcome you here in Triennale, and this is the National Day of the German Pavilion. Uh, because Triennale belongs to the BAE, the Bureau International of Exposition in Paris. There's a sort of a protocol that surrounds all these occasions, but uh, the relationship between Triennale and Germany has been absolutely positive and outstanding for different reasons. But due to the protocol reason, I have to start my greeting um, welcoming here in Triennale the General Consul of Germany, the Deputy Consul of Germany, the Director of the Cater Institute, because thanks to these local authorities, let's call them local because they are based here in Milano, everything was possible. And not only to have Germany as one of the pavilions of the 22nd Triennale, but also because thanks to them we reopen to the public, a space that was not opened since 1964. Because the German pavilion is, all, is just behind the uh, um, bookstores, and you can admire, and then you can see it later, the Carceri di Invenzione show, curated by Anselm Franke, and edited by three authors, which are Armin Linka, Giuseppe Jelasi, and Giulia Bruno. As we often say, with our tutors and mentors to the audience, it's a, a Wagnerian experience because visual art, music, performance and space are combined together to offer a, a tremendous experience of uh, Anthropocene. Uh, let me underline a few other aspects of this um, national day. Actually, um, the collaboration has been blessed and celebrated in Berlin by a very special meeting between President Mattarella and President Steinmeier in the Aus der Kultur und der Welt, where Stefano Boeri and Bernd Scheer uh, introduced to the two presidents and to the uh, restricted audience the teams of German and Italian artists that they are participating, not at the, only at the 22nd Triennale, but also at, in Matera for the European uh, City of Culture. Uh, the ambassador of Germany came in a very informal but warm uh, occasion to visit the pavilion. A delegation from the Bundestag came to visit the Triennale, and it doesn't happen every day for us that um, a close an important uh, country such as Germany uh, has been very present and, and very careful to follow all the steps and visit the work of the artists and authors invited. Um, actually, uh, I'd like to thank once again Aus der Kultur und der Welt, the Commissioner uh, Bernd Scherer, the curator Anselm Franke, the artist Armin Linke, uh, Giulia Bruno and Giuseppe Jelasi for the work and also because thanks to the collaboration with um, Kete Institute we managed to 
connect with the German community here in Milano and several visitors, several Germans living in Milano came to see the pavilion. This was absolutely crucial for us that the uh, show and the exposition is not only for uh, uh, the architects, the artists or the Milanese audience, but the international audience that is based in Milano and works and lives here. Uh, going back, and this is, this is my conclusion, to a few instructions of the day, the, set, the uh, symposium is divided in two sessions. There will be a series like four intervention this morning, and then a lunch break, and then uh, in the Salone d'Onore where we you just had a little breakfast, uh, there will be four round tables with discussions and a sort of like ongoing workshops. And after these workshops, there will be like remarks and conclusion, and we will end uh, with the work of this uh, national day. Um, I now leave the stage to Bernd Scherer for his introduction lecture, which is entitled, What is Anthropocene? Thank you very much, and welcome once again to Triennale. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco Somicelli. Uh, first of all, I would like also to thank all the people and the institutions involved in this uh, marvelous endeavor. Uh, of course, the Triennale with Stefano Boeri, who invited us uh, for today, uh, but also the Goethe Institute, uh, represented by uh, Mrs. Ostwald Richter here. I would like also to welcome uh, Consul General uh, Mr. Krumrai and the Deputy Consul uh, Mr. von Wesendonk. Um, <coughs> can we have now the slides? Uh, oh, okay. So my, my role this morning is to introduce you in the concept of the Anthropocene, uh, a concept which the Haus der Kultur in der Welt was working on in the last seven years in a quite a number of very different projects. Uh, the term uh, Anthropocene uh, basically was coined by uh, a very important Nobel Prize laureate, Paul Krutzen, in 2000. And um, Paul Krutzen uh, was the one who uh, discovered and also politicized the concept of the o ozone layer, uh, the ozone uh, uh, hole. And uh, so he was already very important uh, when he coined in 2000 uh, this word of the Anthropocene in the context of Earth scientists meeting in a, a very important international meeting in Mexico. What uh, did he refer to? Let me start. Oh, sorry. Um, he referred to phenomena which are uh, represented more or less by these uh, diagrams. Um, and here you have uh, two parts. The one are uh, socio-economic trends and the other are earth system trends. Uh, what you see is that these diagrams have all the same shape. They uh, starting with a constant line, and then the line is rising up. Um, and uh, the diagrams refer to basically uh, most important parameters of the Earth system. And what they have also in common is that all the developments represented in these diagrams are triggered by human behavior. So, uh, as far as the socio-economic trends are concerned, for example, you have the rise of world population, you can see, you have the rise of real GDP, uh, you have the rise of telecommunication system, transportation, water rise, water use, paper consumptions, and so on. On the uh, right side, you see carbon dioxide, uh, you see, for example, uh, uh, acidification of the oceans. All these trends, all these developments have been triggered by human behaviors. And what the uh, curves show, show you, this acceleration takes place after 1945. Uh, and the Earth scientists call this the big acceleration. 
the big acceleration. And on the basis of such kind of diagrams, the thesis was that human beings are not only intervening anymore in the Earth system here and there, but they are transforming the Earth system on a planetary scale. And they bring the um, Earth system out of balance by doing so. So when Paul Crutzen said we are living in the Anthropocene and not anymore in the Holocene, he was referring that we are transcending one uh, Earth epoch to the other Earth epoch. So we, uh, basically the thesis is we are living in a new Earth epoch, in a new Earth age. How could this uh, transformation take place? What are the triggers? Uh, what is the basis for human behavior which uh, triggered this kind of processes? Uh, I would like to indicate three uh, triggers. Number one, it's, uh, you can see if you are transforming the whole planetary system, you need energy. Where is this energy coming from? The energy is coming from the Earth, the planet itself. Namely, it's basically fossil fuels which are driving since the 19th century, but really in an accelerated speech in the second half of the 20th century, these uh, processes. And fossil uh, uh, fuels, they uh, have been produced by the planet in biochemical uh, uh, ch chemical processes over millions of years. So what is happening is here that we are using the resources of the planet to transform the whole planet. Uh, s second point, how do we do that? In order to, uh, that this transformation can take place using the resources of the planet, for humans, you need technologies. And one major technology in this process is the refinery. In the refinery, what is taking place is you translate, so to say, the raw material, the raw oil, into uh, petrol, uh, which is then speeding up uh, cars, planes, and so on, and uh, is at the basis of the uh, mobility processes of the uh, last decades as we know them. And the third uh, point, which is very important in this context, is a, a capitalist system which basically on the basis of credits transform the future into the present. Because uh, the, the resource, the financial resources to, to build an airport, to build these big infrastructures which are driving these processes, you, uh, you do not have the resources in the present. You have to transform, so to say, the future into the present via credits. Having said all this, these are the drivers of, the, of uh, these processes. Uh, but what are the implications? What are the consequences of these processes? Uh, there are very important uh, uh, consequences. Uh, one uh, consequence is that uh, what I referred to already, that we have now very different time scales working at the same time. On the one side, we have, so to say, the time of the planet interfering into human time. That means this time of millions of years, which are getting translated by a te via technology in, in human time. So uh, on the one side, you have this kind of millions of years which are interfering with our time. On the other side, because this time is translated into energy, we have an incredibly acceleration of processes. We have processes which are speeding up. So that one can say, we are at the moment living in a situation where we can at each moment communicate with the whole, with the whole, uh, with the whole planet. So um, we are in a situation where we are um, constantly in planetary time. What, what does that mean? We are living, so to say, in, in the now because of the speed of this transformation process is going on. And this living in the now means that two resources of time which we were used to have shrunken to more or less the minimum. That is on the one side the past and on the other side the future. 
The past is necessary or was necessary for a long time because in, gen in generations which we, uh, we uh, build it up, so to say, the meaning of communities, of societies. Um, this is not done in one generation or at, at the moment. So this has shrunk into this kind of now situation. And on the other side, the future was important in the uh, uh, in, in the past because it was the resource for utopian thinking, for developing new worlds in the future. And this kind of reduction to the present uh, has as a consequence uh, what you uh, probably all experience or know from, uh, from people uh, uh, in your uh, neighborhood is this um, phenomenon of the uh, burnout processes. Burnout means, so to say, a psychological uh, reaction to this situation where you are constantly running and you are not moving, really. You are constantly living in the now without having the resources of the future, uh, which is, so to say, utopian thinking and the past, which produced in the past uh, the, the meaning for, uh, for societies. The second point, uh, which is uh, important in that uh, connection, is um, that the classical categories between nature and culture uh, are not any more divided as, we, uh, as modernity constructed them. Uh, we are in a situation where natural processes and cultural processes are completely intertwined. And here is an image by uh, Armin Linke from a dam in China. And uh, water dams uh, is one way of infrastructure of, of the Anthropocene. Of course, in order to develop or to produce uh, energy, uh, we need. And what, what is the implication of this dam? What you can see here on the bottom, let me see here, here you see some people, some more or less lost people. They were fishermen which were uh, used to fish on this river by boat. Now they are capturing the fish here at the bottom of this big dam and they can do so because the uh, fish, uh, because of the pressure of the water, is, uh, is losing its orientation. So the fish are so disoriented that they are easy to be catched by the fisherman. And what this shows you is in which way these physical environments uh, really intervene into the psyche of animals, but also, of course, uh, of, of humans. It's not just a process taking place in nature. It's a process which in a very... Uh, 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 direct way is intertwining uh, nature uh, with culture. And of course, uh, what I mentioned already before is that the um, material world, which was for a long time more or less stable, and this was the stability uh, of, of this world was basically the reason or the, the background for the civilization processes as we know them. You have to have a more or less stable climate in order to develop uh, agriculture at a certain point, at a certain place of the earth. Uh, and uh, on the basis of agriculture later on uh, to, to develop cities and so on. So this kind of stability of climate and the earth system, which was the characteristics of the Holocene, the earth epoch we used to live in, is the was the basis for a long time of the civilization process. And this is now being, so to say, brought out of balance by human intervention. What are uh, the further consequences of this? There is a, a, a deep transformation of uh, knowledge processes which have to be uh, rewritten, so to say. Because uh, the disciplines, the academic disciplines, uh, the scientific disciplines, as we knew them, they were built up in the uh, 18th, 19th century at a time where this earth system was more or less stable. 
Now we are in a situation where this uh, Earth system is constantly bringing out of this stability, and as we saw, uh, saw already, uh, that natural and uh, human processes are intertwined in a way we didn't uh, experience before. So what that means is, for example, that the division of uh, the sciences into human sciences and natural sciences is not functioning anymore because the phenomena, for example, as climate change, uh, as we, we know them, are exactly intertwining human action with natural processes. So we have to develop new kind of disciplines which are reflecting this kind of uh, new, uh, new situation. But also uh, take a uh, classical um, science such as uh, uh, the history, uh, one of the human sciences. Uh, what we experience now is that we cannot speak about human history in the classical sense anymore because ge uh, geologists are writing human history. And on the other side, you, uh, uh, historians of human history are writing geology. Uh, because these processes are, uh, as I explained it uh, uh, right from the beginning, are intertwined. So even this kind of classical, to understand the second half of the 20th century, the human history, you cannot do any more without taking into account uh, the material processes of the Earth system and the other way around. So we have to train in, in the a history department, people who are able to, to relate this kind of material processes to, uh, uh, to human history and the other way around. Uh, this creates problems on both sides. Uh, I welcome Colin Waters, he is here from the Anthropocene Working Group uh, and one of the leading uh, scientists uh, as far as uh, the uh, development of the, the formalization of the concept of uh, Anthropocene is concerned. And he and his uh, colleague, Jan Salasiewicz, uh, who he is working with, um, they are very much uh, involved on the geolog uh, geological side in this, uh, 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 in this discussions, because also the geologists are not really acquainted with the fact that they are speaking about processes where humans uh, transform, so to say, what they call the rock science. <laughs> science of the rocks. And uh, a last point related to in which way uh, the, the Anthropocene is transforming our knowledge system is that um, when you look at the way disciplines were built in the past, they were developed over decades, over a generation, two generations of, of, of scientists. Now, because of these fast transformation processes, um, we speak about uh, a transformation of uh, technologies which one uh, generation of technologies has only a lifespan of five to ten years, in, in some cases even only two to three years. So you can see how this is transforming, so to say, uh, the natural world uh, we are living in. And I give you one example to see uh, how we have to reconceive what we were calling uh, knowledge. Um, Amazon is developing at the moment new uh, uh, storage uh, uh, places. And in these storage places, the goods are coming in and they are just spread over the whole st storage place in a very random way, very chaotic way. And they can do that because each of the workers has a bot uh, around his arm. And these bots, are uh, basically uh, indicating to the worker to which good he has to go to in order to, to uh, bring it uh, to, uh, the, um, uh, uh, to the transport uh, uh, car. So the whole system uh, in these storage places is really controlled uh, by uh, uh, bots and, so to say, a computer system which is guiding each individual worker 
So social interaction does not take any more uh, place in, in this kind of new storage place. The interaction is not between the humans working there, but it's between each human and the system he is related to. And what does this system uh, does? It takes the information the way the worker is uh, uh, taking one good and bringing it to another place and is working on to improve this kind of behavior of each of the workers. So there is a constant feedback going on between the uh, way the worker acts and the system reacting to it improving uh, the, the way the worker acts, but at the same time learning from the way the humans are transporting the goods, learning from that in order to develop, so to say, uh, the best possible way of transporting one good to, uh, to, from one side to the other side. So what does that mean? You, you are in a, in a world where the input, the information, um, in this case produced by humans into the system, directly gets translated back and uh, um, uh, transforming the human behaviors. So there is knowledge produced in this process which directly is uh, interfering again into reality. So what we have is an incredible speed, uh, incredible acceleration of production of knowledge and uh, a knowledge which then is then transforming reality itself again. And this is of course very different because in the past, as we know it, knowledge also was produced in order to understand the world and then from time to time is then translated into technologies and so on. But this took time over, let's say, 10, 20, 30 years. Now we are in a situation where you almost in one minute or in one hour get transformation of realities by the production of this kind of technological uh, uh, informations. I think I, I, I took my time. Uh, I would have introduced you uh, into our work, but I think that is uh, taking too much time. And Ansem Franke, who is the curator uh, of uh, two, three of the projects, is here and uh, is going to speak about that too. So I think I close with, with, this, um, with this sentences. <coughs> so uh, to, to sum up, I think what is important is, on the one side, the Anthropocene is a geological uh, phenomena, and it's at the moment a, a, a classical, let's say, process of formalization of this concept in the natural sciences. But the implication of this phenomena are far-reaching beyond geology. They are transforming really uh, societies, they are uh, transforming the way we produce knowledge in a very profound way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben Scherer, for your introduction speech. And uh, the next hours are um, um, lead by four guests. Uh, start with, um, let me mention all of them, Margarita Mendes, Etienne Turpin, uh, John Palmesino and Armin Linke and Anson Franke, which will start with the two of them because um, as curator and author of the pavilion, they will introduce the work that we can visit later on before lunchtime downstairs. So I ask Armin and Anselm to join here, the, um, thank you, Rosine, um, behind the desk, uh, so also the favor of lights for the video because all this symposium will be recorded. Um, just a few words of, of Carcere di Invenzioni, which is a quote of, um, uh, of an art piece of Luigi Piranesi. Um, it, this uh, um, installation takes into account the relationship between planetary ecosystem, political institutions, scientific inf infrastructures through the visual analysis, that, which includes 
spaces, climate change, social issues, and so on. So thank you once again to curator Anthem Franke and to the artist Armin Linke for your intervention. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, and since, uh, since Bernd Scherer uh, in his uh, wonderful introduction did not get to present the projects that the HKW was, or some uh, um, aspects of the Anthropocene uh, project uh, since uh, 2013. Um, I will uh, do that, but uh, of course, I'm uh, running the exhibition department in the Haus der Kulturen der Welt and the HKW. The, the picture was the very first slide that Bernd showed, um, that, 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 that where you see the, the actual um, uh, <coughs> institution um, and uh, the the way the institution is organized is that it has several departments um, and I'm speaking now only of the projects that uh, my department has organized which is the exhibitions department whereas the bigger part of the Anthropocene project really takes place um, in Bern's department and in the department of literature and science uh, who are organizing and keep organizing um, major projects and gatherings around the theme. Um, but when we started in 2013 with the plan to do a multi-year project called the Anthropocene project, um, I, from the exhibition department's side I was basically inclined to do two things. On the one hand I wanted to revive the collaboration with um, artists and th uh, theorists uh, that I have a, a personally a long wor working relationship, uh, which is on the one hand Armin Linke, and on the other hand uh, John Palmesino and Anne-Sophie Rönskog uh, from Territorial Agency, who will speak later uh, um, this morning. And we basically formed um, uh, a project that was called the Anthropocene Observatory, and that was um, um, a kind of field work um, uh, structure um, that resulted in um, five exhibitions um, during 2013 and uh, uh, 2014. Um, and the field work upon which um, uh, uh, this project uh, that you see here in the Triennale is based basically started more or less with that project, with the Anthropocene Observatory. Um, on the other hand, I wanted to do, a, uh, so the Anthropocene Observatory is basically what the name already says. It's, it was meant to be an observatory, it was meant a kind of almost ethnographic fieldwork of how uh, the institutions of science uh, and how political institutions interact and uh, um, <coughs> uh, to, to try to find frameworks for, for discussing this, uh, this relationship, the shifting relationship between politics and science uh, largely. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was basically to give a little bit of a kind of historical backdrop to the discussion on the Anthropocene and uh, um, the, basically the, the kind of intellectual um, shifts and history of ideas that revolved around um, a kind of pla uh, discussion in the planetary paradigm um, um, some decades ago, basically uh, since the late 80s, uh, 60s, um, simply because um, comparing our moment, or the moment 2012, uh, six years ago, um, with uh, 68 and the early 70s, um, I thought has the potential to, to, to reveal uh, something about the paradigms in which we think. Um, so the choice was uh, to discuss, to basically make an exhibition, a research exhibition, um, on the first photograph of uh, planet Earth uh, taken by the Apollo missions. <coughs> which were at the time sort of often hailed as the true discovery of the of uh, space flight uh, uh, to, uh, to the moon. So it was not the moon, which was, you know, basically the barren landscape uh, that we know it is, um, but that, that sort of uh, gaze that had turned back onto the planet, um, that sort of 180 degrees shift, um, th that sort of at the time w uh, saw, uh, uh, it was thought by many uh, that it had sort of announced a new paradigm, a new relationship, or it was calling for a new relationship um, towards uh, the planet. Um, and um, this relationship was very much sort of mediated in terms of um, 
as, as an interesting combination of cybernetics and ecology. Um, and politically, in a kind of almost, um, almost paradoxical sort of paradigm of, um, of a, a borderless world. You know, the, uh, obviously, um, the space flight to the moon uh, or the Apollo missions were sort of a military demonstration as well at the height of the Cold War. So it was taking place in a divided world, but it was kind of announcing or calling for a unified world, right? Um, and many of the astronauts uh, or cosmonauts as well um, engaged in spaceflight would, would sort of uh, re uh, repeat this mantra in very different versions of like, from up there you don't really see the borders, you don't really see what divides people, you don't really see, um, you know, nations, etc. You see only this kind of larger whole. Um, and what does it? What what is that planetary paradigm about which, uh, which this which this imagery, which this site uh, calls for? So this exhibition basically uh, focused on this uh, 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 publication, which was sort of self-entitling itself to convey the message that that image had to communicate to humanity. Yeah? Like, um, so this was sort of the official medium of what the image of whole Earth has to tell us. And it was a very pe peculiar um, publication, um, really very much in the spirit of uh, Californian counterculture and its peculiar uh, relationship between uh, discourses of uh, an almost anti-civilizationary uh, ecology, a kind of uh, call for a return to nature, and a kind of um, increasingly and a kind of enthusiastic relationship um, uh, to technology and particularly to the networking cap capacities of computers um, that were on the path of becoming personalized. Um, so, uh, and the, the network, the, like the, the, the sort of discourse, the paradigm that mediated between the two was really the discourse of cybernetics, uh, of command and control and circular feedback, um, circular causal uh, relationships. Um, which seemed to, you know, be a discourse that could basically communicate between the paradigms of ecology on the one hand and the world that basically um, computers uh, uh, would, uh, once they become sort of an infrastructure and once they move in themselves sort of into the background like they do today, sort of become a pervasive uh, environment we live in, um, what they share is basically um, this kind of uh, cybernetic principles. So I'm just showing you a few images. The whole Earth catalog uh, was published in uh, 68 by Stuart Brandt, who had already campaigned since the mid-60s, um, uh, asking NASA to release an image of the whole Earth. Um, this is actually not the Apollo photograph, but a satellite photograph, and the first uh, image of the entire planet. Uh, this is the book we published, uh, uh, and this is the name of the entire exhibition. Uh, this is the book we published um, uh, as the catalog, basically, of the exhibition. Um, here you see the back cover of uh, the third edition of The Whole Earth, catalog of the original Stuart Brandt edited um, uh, publication, which was in a way a kind of mail order catalog for um, sort of, uh, you know, um, alternative ways of living for very much a kind of do-it-yourself uh, culture for basically a huge migra migration wave from the cities into the uh, Californian uh, backlands, um, countryside for, you know, sort of hippie communes that would uh, try to build alternative uh, communities, alternative ways of life. Um, so that was the content, um, and there were basically a lot of books um, discussed, advertised, reviewed in it, but there was also like gardening equipment, solar cells, you know, sort of um, um, a, a wild mixture for everything um, that would allow you uh, to, to exit the given civilizationary paradigm, but also to improve it, basically. Um, so this is one of the... Uh, I've, I've mentioned this paradigm already, one of uh, the films, um, um, I forgot now the name of the astronaut who basically made this film, who campaigned also, uh, who has a foundation with the same name uh, called No Frames, No Boundaries. Um, <coughs> later on in the, in the 70s, um, the, the whole network of Stuart Brandt, the whole Earth uh, uh, publications, which included at the time also Co-Evolution Quarterly, became a very important sort of 
um, organ that published really um, a strange mixture of uh, almost esoteric cybernetics and the and very serious earth system scientists um, uh, many of which are today you know frequently referenced or still part of the discussion um, that informs the uh, the current uh, question of um, um, the formalization of the concept or not, and John Palmesino will speak about that, in, uh, I guess, in a little. Um, <clears throat> basically, the exhibition traced how this publication, Whole Earth Catalog, managed to reconcile the idea of nature with the idea of a kind of uh, decentralized network t technological infrastructure. Um, and that that would sort of lead both to a more ecological and to a more democratic world. In the 80s, Stuart Brand was, an, uh, was a pioneer of uh, um, social networking, of social media. He had one of the first sort of uh, um, uh, pre-Facebook um, infrastructures um, in the mid-80s. Um, and you can see here how in the 80s the Whole Earth Catalog itself had sort of turned into uh, a software publication um, that was not so successful, by the way. Um, and basically, the exhibition ended in 1997 when this uh, uh, cover um, uh, was decorating Wired magazine, which is basically the year when more or less sort of the the Californian uh, paradigm, the Californian ideology, as some call it, um, the new economy. Um, that was sort of uh, taking off at the time um, had entered into the White House. It was also um, a moment where, um, um, where basically uh, y you can see a kind of Clinton era uh, optimism was ruling. Um, <coughs> but what this cover actually signifies is, in a way, also the uh, um, uh, something that that Stuart Brand was uh, crucial in, in developing as well, which is a kind of um, predictive method through storytelling patterns, through scenario planning, um, uh, uh, which uh, he, uh, you know, used for for big corporations like uh, Exxon, like Shell, etc. Um, <clears throat> which is basically, you know, about our capacities to script and imagine the future and the way in which these scenarios, if we act according to them, um, sort of increase uh, the likelihood of events turning out in the way that we projected them, which I think uh, when you look at this cover today, uh, um, one can't help but find that slightly ironic. Um, okay, so that was basically the part um, speaking about uh, the exhibition program, there have been uh, uh, three more, three large exhibitions uh, that I will not speak about now just for time reasons, just to mention them by name. One was uh, co-developed with Eyal Weizmann and the uh, um, Forensic Architecture Group in uh, London, um, simply called Forensis. Uh, another one was uh, dealing with uh, human-animal relationships and was called Ape Culture. Um, and then there was a third one which basically took up where the whole Earth exhibition left off in 1907, which was called Nervous Systems, um, <coughs> Quantified Life and the Social Question, which basically followed the kind of technological infrastructure in relation to social engineering since the late 90s. Um, so with that, I kind of wrap up the part on HKV exhibitions on the question of the Anthropocene. Um, John Palmesino, I think, will probably mention a bit more about what we did in the Anthropocene Observatory, which has, as I mentioned, informed the installation you see downstairs. Um, and perhaps it's good that, Armin, you start introducing a bit um, how you have uh, come to develop this piece, uh, the installation downstairs. Yeah. So I. I I didn't, for one time, uh, bring any images because there are a lot of images already downstairs uh, in the installation. Maybe I, I can say that um, for me, this interest on shaping the world or on designing the world began uh, um, something like 20 years ago when I read uh, on, it, on an Italian newspaper on the, on the Espresso the, the fact that in China, the Three Gorges Water Dam was uh, planned. Uh, so basically, uh, they did not only to construct a huge uh, sculptural 
uh, infrastructure in the landscape, but to move two million people, so with, with the whole psychological, uh, let's say, uh, changement that this would need it. So basically it's like flooding a, a city like uh, Milano, uh, moving two million people and reconstructing all the uh, schools, uh, museums, uh, houses, uh, industries, uh, and uh, transportation uh, system. So fr from there on, uh, I began to look uh, and to travel also to, to, to further off some places where, let's say, this idea of, of having a large technological uh, infrastructure that mostly was connected with uh, water systems or energy systems or resource system. Um, yeah, I began a series of, of travels uh, with also some interruptions after five or six years uh, because I met then a friend, uh, uh, Piero Zanini, that told me, okay, but what you're photographing around the world is happening maybe 60 kilometers from Milano. I was still living in Milano, uh, in the Alps, in a place that is very much uh, connected to a, a specific cliche of, um, of nature. But in fact, this nature is, um, is a construction of images. And somehow the Alps were always in the center of themselves, but then from the 16th century with the construction of the idea of, of nations, they were always at the periphery of the capitals and were simply places where energy and other kind of resources uh, could have been produced. So uh, we began to make a film on, on, on this landscape, looking at different nations and um, in a certain way, this was a little bit more easy because it was in a, to create then a narration or create a film or create a narration because in some, somehow there was a kind of a, a more precise unity of place. And, and there were already, let's say, cliches of images on which to build up uh, uh, a narrative. Uh, another interesting uh, Mm, let's say point uh, that, that somehow cons constructed the, the, f the foundation or, or a technique to, to work with was an invitation by, by Bruno Latour in, in an exhibition at ZKM called Atmospheres of Democracies that were uh, it was an exhibition on the question how to depict uh, political institutions and this brought me to another project that was uh, for the Maxi in Rome that was at the moment still, uh, let's say, building up the collection. And they were ask, ask, asking me, um, so it's a ministry, maybe who, who is not from Italy, it's, it's, it's the one of, maybe the only state, uh, federal, let's say, uh, museum of contemporary art uh, in Italy. So basically it's run by the Ministry of Culture. So uh, I thought, okay, but maybe it would be interesting that you I would like to commission you, to commission me, uh, to photograph the Italian constitution and look how, how it's possible to visualize structures, let's say structures that should be structures of democracy, of transparency, how to visualize them. So we took the Italian constitution and listed the whole institutions that are in the constitution and then began to photograph them. So basically it was the Ministry of Culture asking, let's say the other, uh, institutions if it would be possible to enter, not as a photographer dei beni culturali, uh, not as a photographer of cultural, uh, cultural values, uh, not as an architecture or a reporter, photographer, but as an artist, which, which was also something different to, difficult to, to explain. And how this project took about two years. And so when, uh, when we set up Anthropocene Observatory with, with John and, and Ansem and Anne-Sophie Ronskog, somehow these, these uh, precedents were already there. And um, we tried through the research of territorial agency then to, to have a, a, a system of field works. So to enter the institutions, to make uh, in a certain way a, a list of locations where these changements of, of the surface 
of the surfaces of the, the, of the geological surfaces, of the atmospheric surfaces, and of the, let's say, ocean surfaces were uh, somehow visible or could be visualized, which is not, uh, not often easy because, in fact, these are very abstract and, uh, um, and sometimes invisible uh, changements or the visualization sometimes looks uh, is in a tradition of, uh, to make a simplification of an idea of national geographic idea, so that places are very exotical or need to be exotical to be spectacular. So, but this, this exotication then in a certain way creates a distance between our responsibility and the places where these things are happening. So our, uh, now I speak at plural, or let's say, maybe I should say, uh, but let's say we were trying to, in, a, in a certain way to, to, to deconstruct this alienation that is incorporated also in, in this idea of a spectacular image. So maybe to, to finish, what, uh, what we, the installation here, is, is based on this construction of, of different uh, events and different dialogues with many different institutions. So here there is also um, Etienne, uh, with which uh, with, 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 uh, which we made a, a large travels two years ago in Indonesia, and uh, on a specific project um, on palm oil production. So let's say that. The, 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 the installation here works also as, as a construction of many other projects that come here together uh, and create a kind of critical mass. And the idea was uh, in this very particular space that works a little bit like a panopticum uh, of the 18th century, like these inversed uh, planet, planetariums in which uh, like of course, the, the Expo in Paris was one of, of the places where this theatrical device was uh, invented in 18th century. We, we tried to play on this, uh, um, on this theatrical device and create something similar. So you enter this stair, and this stair get to be, uh, bring you to balconies, and these balconies are the places where you, uh, you are, where you can have the views on these different places and something speci special happens, you can travel through time and the space and bring these spaces together in a kind of editing sensorial machine that is then unified by the music of, um, on the soundtrack of, uh, of Giuseppe Gilasi. So it's also a sound landscape, not only a visual landscape. And uh, I have to thank one more time the, the Trenale that uh, was... Uh, willing to open this space that was also a long uh, dialogue. And I know that the Trinale was also taking uh, some specific uh, risks uh, in such a short time uh, when we took the decision. And um, yeah, so it's, it's also uh, a, th a thank you to everybody that uh, participated in this project from the, from, the, from the very beginning, because it's really a, a collaborative project of, of, uh, of accumulation of different knowledge and uh, and dialogues. Thank you. Maybe just to add that later on we will go downstairs together and um, guide you to aspects of the concrete installation. So um, we'll skip this part now um, and just move on. No? Right after the first session, the morning session, we will go downstairs to see the German pavilion, which actually will be one of the legacy of this uh, 22nd Triennale, because the space will become like an institutional exhibition space of, of, of Triennale. Now it's time to introduce the Portuguese researcher, curator and activist Margarida Mendes and uh, her intervention is entitled Rendering the Sonic Ocean, which is um, research that brings us to the shift of thinking how to relate to these topics uh, 
with listening to the environment. And I'm very happy that um, we are actually in a space very close to the Great Animal Orchestra, the installation co-produced in collaboration with Fondation Cartier, where um, asked the, the visitors and the viewer also to stress the fact that the nature and the environment is full of sounds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Does this work? Um, I hope we're still together in this very hot Anthropocene experience. There's a lot of light here, but I hope you can follow me. So um, I'm, I'm one of the guests that's included in the interviews that Armin has downstairs. And downstairs I have a small presentation on deep sea mining, but as my research has been evolving into different endeavors of ocean research, uh, today I'm going to start uh, this, you know, sharing with you a uh, new path towards uh, this sonic ocean that I'm going to be writing about in the next four years. And I wrote something so I would follow, but I hope my English is open to all the listeners here. So, our understanding of the ocean as a sonic space is indebted to the legacy of seabed probing tools and how these technologies constituted visual and acoustic data contrib contributing to seabed design variations along the past centuries. Hence, an acoustic reading of the ocean owes as much to sonic frequencies that refract through it, exposed to the variation of temperature, salinity and pressure, as to the technologies and social processes that shape its acoustic space. The increase of subaquatic background noise, as we can also listen uh, on the installation next door, over the past century incites us to reflect on the conditions of how our knowledge about the oceans came about and how this space has been constructed as a frictionless arena, intimately connected with projects of imperial and capitalist expansion and militarization. So a critical investigation of sensing technologies and how ocean prospection contributes to the design of background noise and new modes of sensibility might bring about a deeper understanding of how sonic agency operates at sea. The interest of sensing the deep ocean began at the sea's edge. The late 19th century beachcombers and naturalist societies are a response to the first scientific expeditions and the first attempts to sound the deep ocean and further our knowledge about this alien side of our planet. By throwing a bucket with a thread and a heavy object at its tip, the technique of ocean soundings was developed. Scientific communities became invested in unveiling the depths of the ocean space and that was then portrayed as a lifeless void carrying hydrographic service as a routine. They would endure the long unrolling of cable sections to guarantee a precise measuring, often spending hours in the wait for the instrument to hit the bottom. Soundings were the early version of bathymetric mapping, the technique of giving coordinates to the topography of the seabed. As Ellen Rojasdowski historically recounts, navigators deployed sounding gear either to locate themselves on existing shards or literally to feel their way as they approached an unfamiliar coast. All sailors used soundings to locate themselves on their mental charts and local waters. The unconventional quality of coordinates brought up by the soundings was unveiled by the tactile frontier of sensing technology, as marine researchers extended cables towards the ocean's depth, longing for a point of contact. It's working? So later, the Azoic theory, or Abyssus hypothesis, was proposed by mineral and fossil collector Edward Forbes in 1843, which stated that life beneath 300 fathoms, that is 540 meters, was inexistent. This thesis was soon contested by biologist Michael Sars, who two decades later found hundreds of new species at greater depth along the Norwegian coast by using dredging techniques. Soon after the first oceanographic soundings, the dredge allowed for the tactile extension of man's reach into ocean's depth, which became the object of increasing scientific and mercantile curiosity. The tradition of natural history dredging dates back to the 1830s, as dredgers lobbied for comprehensive prospection of ocean's depth, soon to be empowered by the speed of the steam engine, which allowed for more precise, deeper and quicker intervention. The technological fingertips of humans scratched the seabed, looking for new species and precious finds, 
scooping the ocean bottom as they drag instruments and abducted critters from their hidden habitats, much like the deep sea mining industry plans to do today. But the naturalists were not the only ones interested in prospecting the deep. The instrumentalization of the seabed as terra nullius, literally a space belonging to no one, to be explored towards man's purpose, was furthered by the lobby of the transatlantic cable industry who interpreted soundings in imaginative ways, particularly by oceanographer Matthew Fontaine Maury, who proposed on his correspondence with the inventor of the telegraph, Samuel Morse, that we know, the existence of a telegraph plateau stating that at the bottom of the sea between the two places, Newfoundland and Ireland, there is a plateau which seems to have been placed there especially for the purpose of holding the wires of a submarine telegraph and of keeping them out of harm's way. The ocean bottom in this area, which, which you can see in the image projected, and you have the telegraph plateau here on your right, was depicted cartographically as a smooth surface devoid of obtuse geomorphology or other geologic obstacles as if purpose-built to accommodate cable laying. So, in Fontaine Maurice says, nature indeed made every necessary preparation for the work. In a statement that enticed stakeholders in to invest in the communication industry by naturalizing the furthest landscape to the purpose of progress-driven society. So the occult grounds of the seabed terrains became a paradigmatic locus for the projection of a particular techno-scientific gaze as the ocean geomorphology was depicted as a metamorphizing milieu that triggered mercantilist aspirations. As geographer Peter Steinberg describes, the ocean has been consistently idealized as a voided space an empty transportation surface beyond the space of social relations, ideal for free trade and navigation. The annihilation of ocean space and its construction as a case of exceptionalism in opposition to land-based territory, since for long it was a space unregulated by law, has made of this free medium an ideal place for investment and trade. The laying of the first telegraph cables marked a crucial turning point in this history, as we know, opening the way for new forms of technologically mediated ocean sensing that turned the ocean into a space of exponential business growth in this era of industrial capitalism that we now witness as millimetrically attuned to the pulse of high-risk high frequency trading. But the telegraph plateau meet only lasted less than a century, appearing in the maps only until 1925. What was indeed revealed by the soundings made in this area and bathymetric service in these terrains was later named as the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. But despite of contradicting arguments on seabed geomorphology, the first cables were laid by the SS Great Eastern between 60, 1865 and 66, connecting hourly and synaptically both sides of the ocean. The first message, which was a 98-word telegram from Queen Victoria to President Buchanan in the US, took circa 17 hours to be transmitted. To this follows successive implementation of further cable projects, reaching also the eastern waters. The ocean soon became an expanded auditory system, a um, medium where nature and culture converge, mediated through new infrastructural projects and remote sensing technologies. Its wiring brought about a new cybernetic sensibility, as these technologies would incite new modes of listening, further exposing the ocean to background noise, and putting forward the signal noise problem as a space for debate about the nature culture divide. So this sensibility would be trained during the Cold War as the use of sonars proliferated, rendering the ocean into a sonic space populated by military agents listening in search of acoustic cues that would reveal the location of enemy submarines. With high training in signal noise distinction and pattern recognition, sonar users had heightened sensibility to recognize the frequency spectrum of vessel and weather noise, seamount reflection, or detect enemy submarines. 
Sometimes, however, this sonic space would not be fully legible due to biotic reasons that will later be proven, such as the intensified noise of crackling shrimp traps popping at a level of 220 decibels, or the intriguing recurrence of the deep scattering layer, the illusion of a false seabed moving during the day, composed of hundreds of small mesopelagic fish that rise to feed by plankton at dusk. And at other times, submarine military tactics would find profit from acoustic definition of the environment that would allow vessels to hide in sonic shadow zones propitiated by studying the refractive patterns of sound in local temperature profiles. So underwater sonic surveillance was further propelled by the American SOSIS program, that stands for um, Sound Surveillance System, which deployed nine arrays of hydrophones in the North Atlantic Basin to listen to marine traffic, enhanced by using the SOFAR channel, which stands for Sound Fixing and Ranging Channel, an area in the ocean's depth where the conditions of water temperature and pressure allow for low frequency sound to travel at great distances. Yet this tool, once used for a classified military strategy, is recently opening its ears to the changing conditions of our planet, registering other sonic events underwater. The SOSIS is nowadays utilized for hydrothermal vents and whale vocalization studies, perhaps some of the data collected in that store, as well as monitorization of water temperature, underwater eruptions, and climate change. Today, the modes of ocean sensing are further complexified as background noise raises alarmingly. Over 53,000 merchant trading ships travel internationally, among them oil supertankers, whose incredible loudness of circa 190 decibels is audible underwater a full day before they arrived or before they are at site. Furthermore, the projects of resource prospection and seabed mapping rise incrementally under the pressure of deep sea mining industry and the international drive to achieve full seabed mapping within the next decades. Often resorting to multi-beam echo sounders or techniques of seismic reflection, which in the case of the latest uses air guns that emit six to seven 240 decibels, that is quite, quite loud, shots per minute, that's 7,000 shots in 24 hours, whose effect has been noted in distance as 3,000 kilometers. And you have to think that sound travels four times faster in water than on air. So it's needless to say that in order to compile geologic information that in the case of seismic prospection, which is the image that we see right here, this uh, image would compile information that goes 30 kilometers inside the Earth's crust. The sonic discharges released by this survey strongly impact underwater acoustic communities who depend on eco-location for survival, as they use forms of sonic emission to locate themselves and their food source in the aquatic environment. And not only large-scale marine mammals, but also micro-scale creatures such as zooplankton show vulnerability to the effect of these seismic surveys. So according to a study published by the Nature Journal in 2017, there is a threefold increase in dead adult or larval zooplankton a fact that would, would seriously endanger the whole trophic chain. So can the existence of background noise be actually changing the course of evolution? How does one stimulate new forms of listening that account to, uh, for how adaptation and engineering converge at sea? One of the theories of the emergence of ecolocation, the form of communication of marine mammals, is that it was sprouted by global climate change at the Eocene transition to the Oligocene 34 million years ago, when the toothed whales started predating for food at depths below the photic zone, so with no light, at the drastic change between the greenhouse to the icehouse world. So in the industrialized area that we now call the Anthropocene, what kind of evolutionary developments made the oversonification of oceans be putting forward. When background noise becomes the foreground piece of evidence disrupting the food chain, we should be more than aware. Only 30 years after the patenting of seismic air guns did the first study start to reveal the implicacy of its use would decrease fish catch rates on it 
2,000 square mile area. At this moment, there is very little knowledge about the seabed and the species that inhabited, both due to inaccessibility and the lack of funds to study. In territorial waters of countries such as Portugal, where I come from, international mining consortiums funded by the EU raw material program are heading the process of seabed mapping. The extractive mentality is leading the way, often depicting the seabed once again as terra nullius, the land with no one, ready to be industrialized. At the same time, activist organizations are appealing for more conscious forms of ocean sensing, encouraging for an ethical debate on how to deal with non-humans, while admitting the broad lack of knowledge that still encompasses the depth of our planet. This form of sensing could perhaps embrace a well-known form of listening that Stefan Helmreich describes as pre-verberations, an echo that potentially accounts, precedes, and anticipates a sound to come. Towards a more comprehensive analysis of background noise, I would add that it is crucial to revisit modalities of acoustic design that were put forward by the generation of acoustic ecologists in the 1970s, such as Barry Truax or Murray Schaffer, whose body of knowledge might guide us to a more eco-conscious form of cohabitation. As they theorize, we are all emitters as well as listeners, and we have in our hands the opportunity to choose the sonic future that we want to sense. For by doing acoustic design, we actually design ourselves. Carefully studying the hybrid space where nature and culture converge within the technologies of ocean survey could perhaps lead us to a more precautionary approach towards ocean media. A step which is crucial in this contemporary moment when there is a pressing shift towards blue economy and the ocean can no longer be considered as a frictionless, voided space but as an extraordinary world emerging out of resonance and continuity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margarita. Also because um, part of, our, of these researches and topics can resonate also in the, also in the Australian pavilion that won the Golden Bee. And it's uh, an, an incredible research by the UTS um, in Sydney. And there's a long story behind this pavilion that also lost all the national funds while they were working on it because the government found very controversial their activity. But we were very happy to uh, support them. And thanks to the collaboration also of Patricia Arcuola, they've been able to put up their own um, pavilion. Um, so thank you very much and also thanks once again to Goethe Institute for the folding fan because this is like a very analogical answer to global warming. Actually, by the way, the last week the system of air conditioning of Triennale collapsed because we weren't able to face the 42 degrees and uh, I'm sorry for this situation but actually behavior, new behaviors, they should start from old behaviors like using folding fan. So the next speaker is John Palmesino, architect, urbanist, and as Anson Frank and, and Amit Lincoln mentioned before, founder of the uh, territorial agency together with Anne-Sophie Ronskog. Um, his intervention, ah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, is entitled Science of the Time, Revolutions and Recourses in the Anthropocene. Thank you very much, John. Buongiorno. First of all, uh, I must say it's very nice to be uh, back home. This is my uh, intellectual home. We started here with Stefano uh, in 1992, I think, uh, uh, discussing what it would mean to rethink and uh, articulate the different uh, conditions of practice of uh, um, intellectual life uh, uh, in a changing world, in a, uh, territorial transformations. And this is also where uh, I think I first met Armin a uh, long time ago. He was doing this an amazing revolving uh, installation of photographs of uh, uh, design changes and uh, technology. 
It's a great pleasure to... It's a great pleasure, of course, to uh, be at the Triennale within uh, the, uh, or in the ambit of uh, the German pavilion, in particular in collaboration with uh, HKV mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, amazing uh, uh, support uh, given by Ben Scherer and my uh, dear friend uh, uh, Anselm Frank. And I wanted to also thank the uh, support of uh, Goethe Institute uh, here in Milano for all the uh, amazing organization. The Anthropocene is obviously a border concept. And today I would like to discuss uh, very quickly uh, a few of these uh, borders, a few of these uh, markers uh, where there's a threshold, uh, and uh, try to understand the radical uh, differences uh, that we are discussing when we are talking about the Anthropocene versus other borders that we might have uh, gotten to trespass or understand during modernity. So the title, uh, as uh, was said, is a very strange one. It's uh, I Segni del Tempo, which is uh, a beautiful book by Paolo Rossi, who depicts the uh, very complicated rise of uh, geology as a science out of uh, uh, full debates about uh, the uh, distinction between uh, history of humans, history of uh, nature, uh, and uh, the title in English uh, is a little bit more dramatic, The Dark Abyss of Time. And the book really starts uh, by highlighting how the so-called scientific revolution uh, in the uh, 17th century coincides with turmoil, wars uh, in uh, Europe, and uh, how the entire debates about the new uh, rationales are also intertwined with complex debates about uh, sovereignty, about the relationship between uh, polities and uh, their um, paradigms, their scientific uh, the scientific uh, debates are completely intertwined with political, cultural discussions from the 16th century onwards. And they are still today. Uh, our uh, dear friends from the Anthropocene uh, Working Group uh, uh, constantly mention that it might all fall apart. It might not actually come to uh, fruition because of the fact that it's so political. Uh, as if science and politics should be, uh, could be so clearly kept uh, separate. But we all very well know that to be uh, objective means to raise objections. So the revolutions, the big revolutions, of course, that we uh, tend to describe is that of the uh, scientific uh, domain, uh, from Galileo onwards, 1610. Uh, I would like to put forward here a counter-hypothesis that the big revolution is a counter-revolution, is a revolution that tries to settle hypothesis, uh, settle uh, what uh, we know, in order to give way to an accommodation of politics that concentrates on a stable world system the possibility of an expansion of uh, a market, uh, a market economy, uh, as Polanyi would call it, that uh, dominates a big part of uh, the world at the beginning uh, through expansion and then through interconnections. This is uh, uh, the very definition by uh, Brodel and uh, his uh, fellow historians that it's an expansion of markets without borders. Uh, a world system is uh, a, a world economy where there's no other possible economy. And what we start seeing, of course, is the rise of Europe from being a rather wet, cold corner of the world, uh, rather poor also, and it expands through a technology to encompass uh, other Earth, other uh, world economies, other world centers. So you start seeing colonization of India, colonization of uh, Africa, of China, and the invasion of uh, the American. The Anthropocene, of course, might 
be simply reconducted to this history, to this uh, history of expansion of uh, the world system. Um, the possibility of just saying it's a further intensification of uh, the rise of capitalism. But we will see that uh, the uh, distinctions are uh, far more uh, interesting in terms of uh, the implications, what is a border, what does it mean to operate at the border of the Anthropocene, what does it mean to uh, think these discussion at a completely different level of magnitude. What we are discovering uh, through uh, the world, uh, uh, the whole earth, uh, let's say, the image of uh, exclusion of humans from uh, the planet. Now, it's interesting that from within the capsule of NASA, the astronauts have to think that you don't see divisions. Uh, they are uh, completely entrapped in a political, technological system, but they imagine themselves not being there. So it's a condition of erasure of borders rather than no borders. It's a technology that pretends that the borders are not there. And the image that is proposed of the Earth system is, of course, very different from the one that is proposed of uh, the world system. This is an image by a group called Globaya that was proposed that uh, the uh, Rio um, conference on ecology in, uh, in, and it shows basically the human imprint without the earth. It's a transparent earth and that's only the humans, so to say. And the other one is without humans. You see, there is a very interesting uh, ongoing distinction here. Nature is without us and we are without nature. And it's a ongoing difficulty in modernity to establish uh, on one side uh, this distinction, but at the same time as we try to establish that, we have a multiplication of hybrids. We have a multiplication of uh, things that don't quite fit, qu things that uh, don't uh, somehow reconcile with the clear cut. And uh, as our friend uh, uh, Bruno Latour would say, it's just an indication that we've never been modern. It's just an indication that that dream of clear cut distinction can never be uh, really attained exactly because the moment that you try to separate, you just discover distinctions and uh, are multiplying in distinctions. So borders are very strange things. What are they? How can they become invisible? How they, and do they operate? What are their technologies? And this is uh, the proposal today, uh, to understand the work of uh, Armin uh, really as a uh, border device, as a technology of border. But let's go through a few images. The five euro uh, banknote is what people might understand more clearly because it relates to a day-to-day -day transition and its violence and its uh, articulation are clearly part of the world system. It's clearly part of capitalism. The fact that uh, our power of purchase uh, is somehow diminished or augmented uh, depending on which side of the divide you're on, which side of the border uh, of the Alps you might be on. And it's something that we might think needs to be regulated, something that we might think needs to be organizing our uh, polities, uh, our con conditions of uh, establishing societies together. We visited in the Anthropocene Observatory uh, an institution called the International, in International uh, Advanced System uh, Organization, and uh, they uh, portrayed to us how they, through their collection of uh, big numbers and the study of uh, world economy and uh, circulation of uh, industry and so on, they discovered somehow curves and uh, uh, mathematical uh, structures underlying the rise and the fall of markets, the rise and fall of uh, the uh, prices, uh, the business uh, cycle being the shortest one, then the Kondratiev curves being rather long, uh, more than 70 years long, all the way to secular curves that uh, add up or in the individual activity. So no matter how much you thrive to uh, operate, you're somehow trapped into this world system. This is what we discuss day daily uh, on, in the news. We discuss uh, the financial market, we discuss how 
politics has to be linked to uh, the relationship to the spread between uh, particular uh, bonds and other bonds, uh, and so on and so forth. The capitalization, as Ben was showing, is here nothing else than an anticipation of mathematical futures, which then guides us completely to uh, regulate our individual interaction, our group interactions, and so on. The underpinning of this, again, as Ben indicated, is a phenomenal rise in energy consumption. Um, from the same organization, YASA, uh, we see uh, the global energy assessment, which is an assessment of all energy used for human uh, sustenance uh, from 1850 onwards. So this is all the energy that humans have transformed and uh, interacted with in order to stay alive. And we start seeing, I don't know if there's a pointer here, from 1850 no, all the way to basically the 30s, there's a slight increase and that has to do with the rise of uh, carbon and then there's a dip in uh, World War I, a second dip in the big uh, economic recession of Wall Street and another dip in the four, in 45 and then the big explosion, the big acceleration. This is the rise of the Anthropocene. From there onwards, we are using more and more energy to do what? To stay alive. And uh, we are more and more. So what you start seeing here is a very interesting uh, correlation in the Anthropocene debates uh, about uh, uh, the so a Malthusian idea that there's a particular relationship between population, economies, and the sustenance of those economies. And these uh, Malthusian's ideas have been, so to say, coming up again and again, a sort of recursive moment in the debates. But what was really different in Malthusian's times, rather than our times, is the material base, the energy base. In Malthusian times, the energy base was still largely coal. Yeah? It was the beginning of coal, actually. What we have today, on the contrary, is an amazing explosion of fossil fuels. And for those of you who might be interested in renewable energies, I might point out that the thickness of the line on top is the energy that is renewable. That's our percentage worldwide of renewable energy today. It's so little. And when we're talking about decarbonization of uh, the economy, we're talking about the possibility of inverting that all the way down to there in order to somehow stay alive. What does it mean to stay alive? How does it uh, really operate? A slightly different version of the same graph, no longer in absolute terms, but in relative terms. 100% usage of the same energy. We move from 1850, where we have almost all of the energy being used from coal, and then, uh, sorry, from, fos from uh, biomass, then you ri see the rise in carbon, then the carbon peaks, declines, oil goes up, stabilizes, gas, hydro, nuclear, and so on. Each one of these moments is a tipping point. It's a trespass of a border. It's a particular moment of passage of territorial transformation. It implies moving from city-states dominating large expanses of woodlands and uh, forests where interpersonal relations are uh, more clearly at hand. You can meet people uh, in the square. Uh, this, the rise of the Italian cities is all about that. And you move into structures that have to be dominated by moving large quantities of and mobilizing large funds in order to achieve extraction of coal. And uh, the, you start seeing the rise of the uh, bureaucratic and the parliamentarian polities. The states, the nation states, are all formed at the same time as the beginning of the industrialization. Uh, we uh, imagine 1848 in Milano, uh, Cinque Giornate is just a convulsion, it's a moment of quasi-revolution in order to form a nation-state in relationship to industrialization. A few years after, 
uh, the Italian uh, somehow uh, state unifies at the same time, more or less, as the German uh, unification happens. So you start seeing that what we imagine as nation states, the history of nation states, is deeply intertwined with the rise of industrial transformations. So what we did in the Anthropocene Observatory was trying to detect how different organizations are looking at this current tipping point, at the current moment of transformation of the Anthropocene. And what we uh, did with Armin was really to go in the vaults of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, trying to understand how they actually put together uh, the uh, science. Uh, we tried to go to the World Bank. We went to uh, all the institutions that were trying to define the Anthropocene. This is a, a meeting of uh, uh, the Social Economical uh, uh, Committee of the IPCC in, uh, in Geneva, where they're about to discuss the relationship between the recovery from the uh, financial uh, crisis in relationship to uh, mitigation uh, of climate change. And uh, the incredible thing about working with Armin, and you will see, is not only that he's depicting things from the most unusual point of view, you know, from within institutions that think that they are operating behind closed doors, but he's indicating uh, that these transformations are always within spaces. They are always within conditions that you can never escape those conditions. So the border condition of the Anthropocene is a very strange one because it's not a border between an inside and an outside, like the all Earth. You're outside, but you're looking at another outside. The Earth is depicted as an outside. In Armin, you're within. In the Anthropocene, we are within the Earth. There's no possibility of escape, there's no possibility of an externalization. And what uh, Ben was indicating, that it's also a compression in time. And it's a compression in time to today, but at the same time, geology, the whole Earth, is today. And this is a really the difficult part, where we don't have any mediation, uh, any articulation of futures or past, and the conditions through which we tried to uh, operate was uh, on one side uh, being as uh, instructive and uh, uh, clear as possible, laying out, for instance, what it means for the Stratigraphic Commission to uh, produce a thick book uh, called the Geological Timescale. And every five years, I think, there's a new book equally uh, thick, uh, as if you know, the entire history is, needs to be rewritten in full scientific detail uh, every time. And so we learned that uh, the Anthropocene Working Group, of, of course Colin Waters, the secretary here, and his friends, Jan Zalasiewicz, Mark Williams, uh, the entire group, uh, are trying to rewrite that book. And that book, which I guess nobody of us has ever seen, is the most important book because it, upon it relies the entire description of our day-to-day -day life. Whether we are independent from our surroundings, whether we are independent and separate, whether there's a border between our activities and a stable world or not. It might be an obscure book, but it's the most important of books. We went to visit uh, people testing wave barriers. We went to uh, visit people trying to change international law. We went to see uh, farmers trying to put up uh, uh, seed uh, uh, storage in order for the farmer uh, and communities to resist uh, big corporations. Uh, we went to uh, visit uh, the high-ranking officials and the people uh, somehow simply bothering about what is happening to their livelihood. And each one of them somehow encountered a particular moment in the uh, interviews that we conducted, and uh, something that Ansem started uh, describing as the Anthropocene trope, where everybody is somehow explaining in a, a very fermented uh, and active way what they're doing, and, in, and immediately stepping back and, say, and realizing that something 
strange is happening to what they're describing, something that they don't quite understand, something that they don't quite get. And this is, uh, was the way in which we then structured the interviews uh, and the films that uh, somehow composed the different uh, moments of the observatory when people are drawn into their studies and at the same time they are repelled by them. Uh, they are shocked by what they're seeing. And this is the difficult part of the Anthropocene tipping point and revolutions, exactly because we are somehow drawn to more and more specific distinction in knowledge and more and more specialization. And the moment we do that, we realize that that is wrong and we are sort of trapped in that tipping point. It's a moment of uh, incapacity of escaping our specialization, so to say. On one side, there's a core for integrated structures, an understanding of culture, popular and high, if we can still use those terms, uh, visual, uh, music, uh, oral, and at the same time there's a call for expertise. And uh, there's a very difficult moment in the Anthropocene, and that is the border is within. It's not only that we are within a changing world, but we are torn. We are completely lost. We don't really understand how to operate. And one of the uh, amazing things that we are very proud of uh, is really that uh, we started uh, working with uh, some uh, members of the Anthropocene Working Group. Uh, we managed to uh, have the first convening uh, with all the people at Hakave. Hakave hosted uh, the first meeting of the Anthropocene Working Group. And uh, I'm very happy to hear that uh, the uh, continuation of the work is also guaranteed by an art institution. Uh, so the tipping point is also the relationship between art and design and science. Politics is hovering around, maybe like a vulture, uh, trying to understand what is happening here. This is Jan Zalasevich with the new logo of the Anthropocene, uh, which has a very interesting dip just before the uh, spike, so to say, of the Great Acceleration, which Jan told me might be the short ice age or something like that. The point is that we are within cities, we are within landscapes that are equally changing the material structures. We are not only talking about the uh, world system, we are talking about the earth system, which is completely transformed, and it's transformed in a very strange way. It's transformed in non in uh, coetaneous ways, not in uh, situations of uh, waves one after the other, but with intensification and complex geometries where things are old and new next to each other, uh, where new things are beneath old things, uh, where uh, the expansion of human activities is spreading so much that we can no longer talk about cities uh, because they used to be uh, smaller entities than what they are today. Here's Paris and in color you see our work in order to detect changes in the latest years. And all of this, of course, as Margarita was mentioning, is only possible through the very same technology that allowed transformation to happen. So we are within another very interesting tipping point where we can experience the Anthropocene only through the technologies that have enabled it. There's no other way that you can actually sense what is around you. You cannot really smell CO2. You can read very complex scientific data, very complex uh, institutionalized uh, reports on it that rely on complex uh, sensors and complex scientists. So there's a constant mediation. And so on one side, we have, uh, and this is, I think, the most difficult thing for uh, architects and artists uh, and uh, people who are trying to mediate. On one side, we cannot mediate between specializations and generalizations. And on the other side, we only have media. We only have complex iterations of mediations, articulation, representations of representations of representations. One of the most intriguing ones that I found is in a book called uh, The Revolutions That Made the Earth by Tim Lenton and Watson. We have the atmosphere, we have to cut. Hmm? Atmosphere, land, ocean, uh, relationship, and fossil fuels are there on the side, but of course when we start 
putting the fossil fuels, and this is what happens in the Anthropocene, is that we create waste. And the biggest waste, the biggest rubbish, uh, is not what you see in the street. It's what is in the atmosphere. It's the fossil fuels that have moved from underground to air. And they're not being recaptured back by the oceans, they're not being recaptured back at a, a significant rate by uh, plants on uh, land. And this is the real issue, that the rise of the Anthropocene, uh, or as Peter Half would say, the rise of the technosphere, is from within a condition that is completely designed, completely articulated by human endeavor. But it has reached a significant structure, significant size and magnitude that it's now self-organizing, except that it's not recycling. The, my, there might be a moment of homeostasis between uh, the uh, different conditions of land, uh, ocean and atmosphere where all fossil fuels have been extracted and they become, so to say, in a cycle. But we might not be there. We might not be able to uh, ever witness such a situation. It might be a sit an earth that has completely tipped into a frontier that is in uninhabitable. This has to do, of course, with the fact that we extract oil. And with the extraction of oil, we create fertilizers to keep us alive. We transform landscapes, we transform supply chains, we transform cities, we transform our very uh, idea of what is an industrial landscape. One of the uh, little uh, exercises we're doing with Colin is actually to measure how heavy is a city. And uh, the rough estimate of the technosphere is 30 trillion tons. 26 centimeters of rubble everywhere. How heavy is a city? What goes in? What goes out? What is the metabolism? What is the material basis of our life? How do we move to understand that we are within that system? And this is the uh, amazing uh, organizations uh, that a concept like the Anthropocene allows us to do. How do we start thinking, designing cities in order to augment the biosphere in order to capture more carbon rather than distinguishing it. It's very interesting. This is an uh, exhibition called Broken Nature. There's dead wood. There's a picture of uh, uh, some trees over there. And the only things that are alive is us and some bacteria around us. Nothing else. This is how we constantly operate. Even in an exhibition about nature, we only have dead things. We are always the only things alive. How do we transform that and become more sensitive to the transformation? So the whole Earth, that was this image from uh, the outside, is now a, an image from within. The, for instance, if we start simply looking at what is measured in the ocean, uh, again, again a tip to uh, Margarita, we start seeing that there's no possibility of us imagining the ocean as a great expanse of uninhabited space. It's full of stuff. It's full of us. We are the ocean, and the ocean is becoming us. There's a usual narrative in ecological thinking is that nature is pristine, and we are intruding on it. But I think this is the biggest barrier, the biggest threshold. Uh, once we start thinking from within the Anthropocene, that distinction is no longer tenable. A pristine nature and us intruding. Nature is no longer out there on which we intrude. Nature is little pockets uh, amongst us, uh, very little niches that are uh, being left over from our rise. So we should need to, I skip that, understand that maybe uh, what we are doing and uh, is not only global warming. And uh, Ben uh, said uh, it's uh, the breakdown, the burnout. I would uh, try to think that this is actually uh, the continuation of World War I and World War II and the Cold War. We are now in the warm war. The conditions through which we are operating are a warm war. We, it operates within us. And we are now so big that we are transforming all of the uh, planet. So the warm war is a situation where uh, 
somehow instead of having a fizzle out of the Cold War, we have to name the situation we're in. We have to name it clearly. It's a war that is continuation of the wars of the 20th century. It's an escalation of them. And once we name it, I think that we also need to do a very clear, bold move, and that is to declare peace. We need to uh, declare a climate peace. We need to be clear that there's no longer a condition of enemies, us and it, nature, but we need to understand that those who are negating climate change, those who are negating our conditions, are not only our enemies, but we, are, we have to surpass that moment of war. We have to find peace with them. We have to find uh, conditions of, uh, not appeasement in nature, which is an idea of uh, the 16th century uh, return to nature, but we have to find a way to be at peace with us in order to uh, survive. Uh, so this is the uh, structures, I think, that have guided the Anthropocene Observatory uh, work with uh, Armin Link and uh, Ansem. Uh, an idea where architecture, photography, filmmaking and uh, design accompanied the amazing discussions of uh, um, uh, the uh, Anthropocene project at uh, HKV. And I'm very happy that Anthropocene Observatory in its new format of the Carceri di Invenzione has come back to Milan in the Trinale and that the discussion can continue. I think that you might be also delighted to hear that uh, the, a new iteration of uh, the work is being carried uh, on again uh, in uh, Matera, uh, a sort of prehistoric moment, uh, maybe a return of pre-civilization of uh, the whole earth. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for your... Uh, I mean, I was <laughs> thinking what could be the toolkit to face a warm war, but, um, and for sure it's not the folding, only the folding fan that we've got. But um, the last intervention is by um, Etienne Turpin and Troy Cochrane that are asked to join the stage here. I don't see them at the moment. Here you are. Yeah. Um, Etienne already joined Triennale in several moments during Broken Nature, Design Takes on Human Survival, and is a philo philosopher, a researcher, and academic, and is um, 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 intervention is entitled Accumulating Outside. Thank you, Etienne. Okay, great. Um, wow, it's a very odd view from the front. I didn't expect to see. Uh, is this an Armin photograph? No, it looks like Indonesia sticking through the through the back door. Um, so thank you for for the invitation, and it's really a, a tremendous uh, pleasure and honor to join this this uh, cast of speakers because. In 2012, um, I was a postdoc at the University of Michigan, and we did an event on the Anthropocene, an experimental conference on the Anthropocene. Um, and, and, and Troy was an enthusiast of this conference and said, yes, you should do it. We should, we should be thinking about this concept. And, and following the conference, my dean said, no one will ever care about this. Um, and shortly thereafter, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to join this uh, Anthropocene uh, curatorial experiment at the uh, HKV with Margarita and, of course, with the Territorial Agency and Anselm Bernd and Armin um, in, the, in the observatory. And this was, uh, for me, it was, uh, uh, yes, some people are going to care about this. In fact, they may spend a better part of a decade working on it. And so uh, it's a real pleasure to try to bring some of the thinking that uh, Troy and I have done around the relationship between the environment and the economy, uh, broadly speaking, uh, to, to this conversation. So as part of the conversation with Armin and Anselm in developing the work uh, that's downstairs in the German pavilion, um, we started to 
talk about this question of um, where does accumulation come from? Where, where, does, where does the wealth that we nominally, uh, allegedly accumulate come from? And um, what's left in its, in its place? And so this question of what is the outside uh, which we are accumulating to the, to the inside in, in reference to uh, John's question of the Anthropocene border is, is a quite important question for, for, for the work that Troy and I have been doing. And so to put that in a historical frame very briefly, it's discussed in more detail in the little uh, video uh, piece inside of Armand's work, but the, there were two figures that I became quite interested in uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, and this evolves out of a conversation uh, bet between Troy and myself. On, on the one hand, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Rosa Luxemburg writes uh, The Accumulation of Capital, where she makes a very important argument, uh, a, a, a fork, if you will, from Marx, that primitive accumulation is not a temporal phase. We do not have a moment of primitive accumulation that then goes away, but that the, function, the functions of capitalism require a perpetual invention of frontiers, of outsides, which they can accumulate. And a radical gesture in its time, a um, hundred years after her assassination, we returned to Rosa Luxemburg to say, how is this understanding of the accumulation of the outside relevant to us today? Uh, specifically uh, in trying to understand and follow uh, the work that Armin produced in the exhibition. Uh, about 10 years later, uh, Jakob von Oekskol invents a kind of form of biosemiotics which also begins to understand the various nested um, outsides that are involved in accumulation. And so for, for those of you not familiar with von Oxwell's argument, very simply, he says that we are uh, all creatures living in a particular environment, share that environment. We're all, I mean, uh, as John said, there's not a lot of other things in here. We've, we've removed a lot of the other cohabitants in this particular environment other than the dead trees. But in a general sense, in, in the field, in the, uh, we have an environment where all creatures are sharing that space, but they're not sensing the same space. And so in Von Oxkull's images, he tries to understand the various sensory relationships between, for example, a tick and a human being, where a tick only requires the sensation uh, of sweat uh, to find its way into the human flesh. Uh, human beings, of course, have a much more complex sensory system. But what I began to find, find really interesting in our, in our conversations around the accu accumulation processes was that for Rosa Luxemburg, the accumulation of the outside was colonization, was imperialism, was India and Africa, as John brought up. But there is also an element of capital that starts to investigate all of the umwelts, as von Oxkull calls them, that starts to explore and look into the ways in which other sensory regimes within the biosphere can be appropriated and pulled into its own uh, milieu of, of accumulation. And so with respect to uh, the work uh, in the German pavilion, um, I was quite fortunate to travel with Armin and, and Sophie Springer and uh, Julia Bruno in, in Indonesia. And I give you a, a jump ahead from, from Luxembourg and Von Oxkol to contemporary Sumatra. What you're looking at is an oil palm refinery uh, in Sumatra. And the trucks that are lined up there are delivering oil palm uh, into the refinery where it will be processed into crude palm oil and shipped by boat to the Asian BRIC countries, uh, India and China, uh, to be injected into every single product that we use in the West. If any of you had the luxury of taking a shower this morning, brushing your teeth, using shampoo, uh, potentially putting some cream in your coffee, you will have interacted with this landscape at, at some distance. But the inclusion of palm oil in nearly every 
form of commercial product, uh, including hygienic products and, and those which we consume, uh, edibles, uh, is, is quite consequential because, as, as John has explained, it redesigns the earth itself. And so this is what you're collecting when you're harvesting uh, the palm fruits, each uh, of the palm oil trees on the plantation is producing roughly between 15 and 20 of these bushels of palm fruits. And I think it's important to get a sense of the material culture of this. How are we accumulating the value of this particular form of life and bringing it into a process of human accumulation? Uh, so each one of these is roughly 40 kilograms, and it grows in 21 days, each particular bushel. And so what, what is important to understand is that the palm oil production relies on the highest energy conversion rate of anything on Earth. This beautiful palm tree with this beautiful canopy, which somehow is also hanging out the back door of this, of this audience right now, it's amazing, um, has the highest biomass conversion rate on Earth. It can s literally turn the sun into this product in a, in a rate which humans could never uh, invent. Uh, and because of this, w humans have responded by terraforming the Earth itself to improve the conditions for uh, such a product to flourish. And as that product is funneled into literally every form of commodity which we consume in the West, what we begin to understand is that the accumulation of the outside is an energy conversion process, which, of course, completely transforms the look of the Earth itself. And so at this point, I want to hand over to Troy to discuss not only how we take in the outside, but what we dump back out there, because this is the second, I think, the second half of the consideration. Uh, I want to start by thanking Etienne for inviting me to join him on this talk, and I want to thank Armin and the Chianale for letting me uh, join in on this conversation. Um, watching uh, Etienne's video contribution, um, my ego had to identify that, that certain parts of this conversation that we've been having for basically a decade were being expressed um, in, in what he was saying. And similarly, uh, a presentation I gave a couple of years ago that I went and revisited uh, after Etienne invited me to join, re-watching, I was like, much of what I'm saying is Etienne uh, speaking through me. So. Um, there is a high degree of, of collaboration uh, even in my own individual work uh, and my ego insists that some degree of collaboration is also present in Etienne's collaborative work. Um, so if I can colonize his impressive output, um, I will lay, lay claim to a certain uh, component of that. Um, I am an economist um, and uh, I recognize that that is a dirty label um, mostly because uh, economists are largely dangerous charlatans who ha uh, bear a great degree of responsibility for the perilous situation that we find ourselves in uh, and who continue to excuse uh, the status quo. Um, people may be aware that um, William Nordhaus just won the fake Nobel Prize that's awarded to economists. Um, and he won it for his work on climate change, which uh, on the surface is kind of an impressive acknowledgement of the fact that economists are starting to take this matter seriously. The reality, though, is that William Nordhaus's work has been to trivialize uh, climate change as ultimately inconsequential. Um, and really, the, the present value of the future costs of climate change are minimal, and so we should put very little effort into trying to transform our economies to uh, deal with this, this, future, this future cost. Uh, in making this argument, one of the things that Nordhaus has done is said, let's, let's try to cost what will the, the effects of, of a temperature increase on the Earth be. How might we do that? Well, we don't have any sort of, of temporal model, so we'll substitute a spatial model. 
So let's take two points on the face of the Earth that have about a 10 degree temperature difference. Say, Copenhagen and Tempe, Arizona. The, the GDP per capita in Copenhagen and Tempe, Arizona is almost exactly the same. So now let's translate that temporally and say, okay, if the Earth's temperature increases by 10 degrees, really there will be no greater difference than the difference that exists between Tempe, Arizona and Copenhagen. The fact that this argument could even be conceptualized is fascinating, and if it had remained a work of science fiction, we could all have a good laugh and say, that's phenomenal. The fact that a powerful man in charge of devising policies made this argument and now is being awarded uh, high accolades for it is incredibly dangerous. And the sooner that we can marginalize the voices of economists, uh, the better off we'll be. Uh, and I say that as an economist. So an, an important, um, the important role of, of economic valuation is distinguishing between this inside and this outside. What are we actually counting? And the etymology of account is count, and count's etymological roots are cut. So when we account, we create a cut that demarcates this inside and this outside. And in the, the talk I gave two years ago, it began from these two um, article headlines. The first one comes from uh, an academic journal article from 2014. So in 2014, maybe this is hard for people not in this world to believe, but we could ask the question, can banks individually create money out of nothing? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. That is absolutely how banks create money. That's where most of our money supply comes from. Banks just make it out of nothing. The second headline comes from The Guardian, and it says, a giant insect ecosystem is collapsing due to humans. And I ha part of my co ongoing conversation with Etienne had me thinking about these two things in tandem. And so I thought we could mash them up uh, and ask, are banks destroying insect ecosystems? The answer, again, is yes. And, is, and destroying ecosystems creates money out of nothing, because we are evaluating a world where we are destroying insect ecosystems, creating palm oil plantations, and then saying about a place like Indonesia that its economic development is this phenomenal achievement, and don't get me wrong, that the increase of standard of living for many Indonesians is a phenomenal achievement, but that, uh, that evaluation of this growth that they have achieved has been an evaluation of ecological transformation, much of which occurs outside the systems of, of accounting. So I want to... Um, uh, I, I spoke of Indonesia's phenomenal growth. Um, at the material level, there is no growth. And this should perhaps be obvious. We live in a materially closed system. Uh, very little is added to the earth. And so all we can do is just continually transform the material composition of the earth. So we're taking those materials, recombining them in different ways. We uh, clear out Indonesian rainforest, terraform the, the land, put in palm oil plantations, and rely on them to uh, draw on the sun's energy to generate these incredible quantities of, of palm oil. That is a reorganization of the Earth's materiality. Uh, and I want to, I want to um, acknowledge the work of Bataille, which informs the way that, that I think about these things, and Bataille's main uh, concept is one of excess. And so in this material transformation, we do have the generation of an excess above and beyond what might be considered the baseline of our existence, um, and that that excess is both biological uh, where we have coral reefs, we have tigers, we have all sorts of beetles, we have um, uh, forests, 
Uh, we have blue-footed boobies. These are all forms of excess. Uh, fabulous mushrooms. Uh, seahorses, excesses of every sort. None of this needs to exist. It simply is life's generative capacity to create ever more, ever new, uh, ever phenomenal existence. And then we also have anthropological excess. Um, we have temples. Uh, we have uh, seafaring raiders. Uh, we have the two row, row wampum of the Haudenosaunee. Uh, we have the Hindu sutras, we have Greek philosophy, uh, we have American sitcoms. All of this constitutes forms of anthropological excess that again, at a material level, is just transformation. We're taking one thing that exists and generating something else that exists. Uh, so where growth actually comes from is a process of quantitative assessment. So we take this process of transformation and we assess what is occurring. So we have the world in one material state and that state is, uh, a, to that state is assigned a certain dollar value. We transform the world into a different material state and to that state is assigned a different uh, quantitative financial value. When the second value is greater than the first value, that is growth. So it's this process of evaluation that constitutes growth because materially there is nothing added to the system. So my claim is that growth is a financial expression of aggregate preference for the new state over the prior state. But of course, those who get to have their preference known, that is not equally distributed. So growth is a function of power. Whose voice, whose assessment, whose evaluation is being counted in saying, we prefer this state over the prior state? Whose evaluation says, we prefer an Indonesia in which rainforests have been destroyed and palm plantations have been put in their place. So we have this cycle between quantitative transformation and quantitative assessment or evaluation. And that is where value emerges out of. Because there is no generation of an actual material surplus, we have a generation of, of newness that is evaluated to be preferable to the previous state. And that is what makes these two things make sense in our current system, where that evaluation requires this radical outside into which things can be pushed, into which all of the waste that we don't want to think about, we don't want to evaluate, we don't want to account for, gets sent somewhere else. But of course, it always ends up coming back to us one way or another. And so that operation across the boundary line, the inside and the outside of this accounting, and the fact that we are now confronting falling growth as a consequence of bygone growth is a function of past power now impacting us today at such a level where even those who have power now have to start reckoning with these realities, have to start accounting for these realities for better and in many ways for worse. So the, the final point uh, I want to make is that this evaluative process, this uh, process of power, is one that we can and should be intervening in because there is no um, objective basis for these evaluations. Uh, it is a, a highly distributed intersubjective process. There are ones that can be, can be confronted uh, and of which we can demand this evaluation needs to take place on a different basis. You need to start accounting for the things that have been pushed into the outside. You need to start bringing into the inside what has been uh, ejected from this system.
Yeah, before going downstairs, so you heard my, my thanks. Uh, going downstairs to see Carceri di Invenzione Pavilion, uh, I'd like to invite back to the here Ben Scheer and um, Professor Colin Waters for a few words and uh, yeah. Yeah, yes, for later, but, ah, it's, ah, okay. <laughs> because Ben wanted to have you here yeah. because yeah. you've been quoted many times by the audience, but of course your intervention is planned for later uh, for the conclusions. Yeah, please do it now. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I just want to introduce to you uh, Colin Waters. Uh, he is from the Anthropocene Working Group. Uh, and when I mentioned at the beginning uh, um, that the reference point for our work at the, at the beginning was Paul Crutzen, uh, that is right. Uh, Paul Crutzen really coined the work for the discussion as we know it. I mean, the work, work was uh, historically used already before that. But I mean, uh, Paul Crutzen was the, uh, the man who really coined the word for the discussion we are in at this moment. But the real work is done by the Anthropocene Working Group. And uh, we had uh, the pleasure to work with the Anthropocene Working Group right from the beginning, right from uh, 2012. The group started in 2009. Uh, and uh, the Anthropocene Working Group is responsible, so to say, for the investigation process to formalize the concept. And Colin is uh, speaking later on in the afternoon, but maybe you are not here, all of you, in the afternoon, so I just wanted to take the chance to present uh, him and the group to you. Perhaps you say a few words to the group. Yes. As, as Bert mentions, it's, it's strange that uh, Paul Crutzen, who was an atmospheric scientist, Earth system scientist, had come up with this term in 2000, and clearly he was talking about a geological term, and it took uh, until 2009 before geologists, including myself, actually realized the significance of this term and started to investigate it. So the, really the last 10 years, we as a group have been trying to make sense of that inspirational comment that Paul had back in 2000. Um, so what, what I'll be doing later on this afternoon is talking about the scale of the Anthropocene, um, just trying to quantify, which is what we've been doing over the last 10 years, saying how large our impact is over the last 70 years. Um, but also, I want to uh, acknowledge the, the significant input that Hakeve have had on our work and, and are doing uh, we've got funding via HKV, which means that we can now carry on doing our research. Because as a body, we have no funding. We are just a group of scientists, and actually outside of science, we've got historians, we've got archaeologists, we've even got lawyers involved in the study. Um, but the only thing we had as a resource was our intellect and our ability to discuss this, this concept, but no funding. And now we have the availability of that funding means we can progress at an incredible rate and we hope in the next two years um, to be in a position where we can uh, put forward a proposal. And so what I'll also talk about is some of the environments that we're studying to try and recognize the Anthropocene. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Colin. Uh, from our perspective, uh, this is also quite an adventure because uh, as a cultural institution working with natural scientists, is not such an easy task, I tell you. Uh, so it needs time really to combine, so to say, the both cultures. And uh, to do that, I think, is itself already a consequence out of the findings of the Anthropocene. That the geological transformation the group is working on has so deep uh, consequences for the way we understand humans, we understand economy, as we just heard, as we understand uh, but social processes, uh, as we heard the whole morning, that it's so important that we have new coalitions also across the disciplines and the major bridge to uh, uh, go over is really between the humanities and the natural scientists, uh, natural sciences. So uh, I think it's quite a challenge and I'm uh, very happy that uh, uh, the Anthropocene Working Group uh, with Colin, uh, Jan and the others are engaging from their side in this process. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you, Ben Chair, and thank you, Professor Colin Waters, uh, because it's an absolute honor for Triennale to host this kind of panels because it will help us to set the agenda for the upcoming Triennale that will be in 2022. Actually, we have to deliver our papers uh, in Paris by November, and we need people like you to propose something that it won't be just an exhibition trend, but something that will be stand and be relevant for institutions, universities, and museums that want to take part of this uh, program. So now you can visit with Ansem Frank and Amin Linke the uh, German pavilion downstairs, and then after we wait for you at the Salone d'Onore because Goethe Institute will offer a lunch for all the participants of this symposium. And in the afternoon, the round tables are ready to have all you to participate there. Thank you very much.